I'm going to be talking about what we need to think about regarding the hybrid gallerist business models. Things are changing really fast and only by coming together today and discussing about what the implications of that are can we work together to try to understand it and work through it. These are just a short list of the closures in 2016. The brick and mortar gallery is under serious attack, as is the Leo Costelli artist gallerist model. Two market pressures account for the shifting tectonic. There are over 300 noted art fairs at this point, and gallerists are doing over 40% of their business away from the physical gallery. Rent has entered the stratosphere, with Chelsea costing up to an average of 80 to 100 or even more per square foot. The new business models are, are, however, emerging around the classic roles that our three panelists have discussed as they go through the various stages of their careers, embracing different types of freedoms and different types of opportunities. These are primarily gallerist, dealer, and art advisor. This chart shows to whom typically each role owes legal duties. The, the gallerist in the primary market working on artist consignment has a disproportionate legal duty to the artist. We have the dealer in the secondary market. I'm just using the general legal term of entrustment. It's also a form of consignment, but we're not going there right now. And most of the legal obligations are to the seller, obviously. And then in the case of the advisor, where you get your income from the sale, your loyalty is exclusively to the client buyer. As an art advisor, if you're being paid by a client buyer, you have exclusive obligations to that client at the expense of all other stakeholders. So what we have here is the five boroughs of art business and what it means in a legal sense. And the, the reason why I'm leaving it in its complexity right now is to give you an idea of how many different sources of liability where you could get hit from. A gallerist in the primary market will have special fiduciary duties to artists even after leaving the physical gallery. The main source of these special fiduciary duties are the consigned artworks, the funds held in trust, and within the artist representation relationship. A gallerist acting as an art advisor is the agent fiduciary of the client buyer. In both these cases, artist-gallerist relationship, hybrid gallerist in today's world also functioning as an art advisor, the following duties arise in those two relationships. The duty of loyalty, to have no conflicts of interest, to have transparency, no undisclosed profits, and to exercise prudence in that relationship. Prudence in the dealings with the artist and prudence in the, in the dealings with a dependent client buyer as an art advisor. These duties exist even if a contract says the opposite or even if there's no contract at all. A gallerist acting as a, as a dealer, however, in the secondary market, buying and selling secondary artworks is largely a commercial transaction subject to what's called the uh, Uniform Commercial Code, which is a body of law across the United States to try to make buying and selling things easier so that people at different, different states in different situations can rely on each other. Then you have tort law, which is basically a default situation where you have to behave in a way that you're taking reasonable care in a situation, not exposing someone unnecessarily to risk. That exists completely independent of contract. And then you have the layer of contract itself, if you have one. And in some rare cases, as a secondary market actor, you have an issue of bailment and agency law. That means when you're sales don't reach the level of you actually being an art dealer, you're considered by the law to be more of a private person, and in that situation there are other duties that would, can arise. And they can rise, they can go in the direction of these fiduciary duties that I just mentioned that we're going to cover in a little more depth. So let's look a little closer at what these fiduciary duties mean because they are not very well known. Fiduciary duties change the nature of obligations that people owe to each other in very unexpected and dramatic ways. Instead of equal parties to a contract, fiduciary obligations create two distinct roles. The fiduciary, that's the gallerist or the art advisor, 
the person who has power in the situation and the person who's dependent or has to rely, the entruster. It's really important to understand that whenever the word agent, whenever you're an agent for something or somebody, you have some degree of fiduciary duties. So anytime you're acting on somebody's behalf and it's considered an agency relationship, you have special obligations, whether you have a contract, whether you contemplate these things, whether you've even heard about this, whether you even think that you don't possibly, by virtue of what you're doing, create such obligations, the law has those obligations in place and will enforce them against you. And again, when agency fiduciary duties are present, they can trump any contract. Fiduciary obligations order unique and valuable social relationships. We find fiduciary obligations in doctor-patient relationships, lawyer-client relationships, amongst partners in a business venture, and in corporate governance. Fiduciary duties are imposed by society to balance power differentials. I think any veteran of the art context will agree to is that without having a high degree of reliance on other actors, it's impossible to really function. And so, interestingly enough, the law has regimes in place that mirror these types of experiences, these types of expectations that we have. So relationships of trust in the art context are in fact inseparable from these fiduciary obligations. Important to understand is that fiduciary ob obligations are imposed by courts. If you are an art advisor, you're a gallerist dealing uh, with an artist, and you do something that makes business sense to you, or even might be fair from a business point of view, but can be understood as abusing your power in this situation, a court, through the vehicle of the fiduciary obligations that you have, can basically claw back your profits or force you to perform or perform differently in this situation. So courts are the source, effectively, of these fiduciary obligations, not our expectations, nor our contracts, etc. There's two primary duties, loyalty and prudence. The gallerist must be loyal. The art advisor must be loyal. That, is, that means they must be free of conflict of interest. He or she must act only in the interest of the artist or the advisory client. And also, in, in the dealings, there must be prudence. You have to use your experience, your professional capacity, in order to make decisions that, that genuinely reflect the interests of your artists and your, uh, and your clients. Gallerist, art advisor, cannot act for the benefit of a third party whose interests are in conflict with those of the artist or advisory client. Gallerist cannot act for his or her own benefit to the detriment of the artist or the advisory client without being transparent about this. That means you can't sort of engage in dealings that are in lacking in transparency, invisible in these special relationships. It's also imperative that all profits be discussed, and that everything be disclosed, that any benefit that would accrue to you be very clear to the artist or to the client. These are things that are often not understood. The, these things are not properly disclosed. If the matter ends up in court, the default fiduciary obligations will force full disclosure and disgorging of any profits. The artist or art advisory client is not obligated to even ask for this or to provide for this or even know that this exists legally. It's simply imposed externally by the law. The fiduciary exposure lasts a very long period of time and it's not very easy to get out of. Art advisors and gallerists who are in relationships with artists balance agency costs. Agency costs arise when the art advisor or agent or a gallerist in this sense takes discretionary but imperfectly observable actions that impact those stakeholders. So despite being not well-known, fiduciary obligations and agency relationships are at the core of post-brick-and-mortar practice. Solution is get good contracts. At no other time is it as important to know where risks are coming from. Having no contract does not mean that there is no law. It just means that you are playing Russian roulette. Much of this law that we're talking about is directed towards holding you accountable in ways that may or may not have anything to do with you. you they may not, they may, it may not be fair at all. Sources of law will be determined. 
The only way to deal with legal risks, especially fiduciary duties, post brick and mortar, is to have the right contracts in place. Two slides on non-fiduciary legal issues because they're less complicated and generally better understood. Selling secondary involves a very different palette of obligations. The most important thing to remember, just as I mentioned a moment ago, even where there's no contract, there is a ton of law imposed on you. Secondary sales are largely controlled by the, uh, the Uniform uh, Commercial Code, UCC for short. Then there's tort law, which I mentioned, which, which we will reduce to the negligence here. Long before you even think of a contract, every second, secondary market transaction is de determined by a web of def default laws. The UCC sees you before you see it. All of the default warranties that are listed here are in place to protect the buyer and ensure speed of transaction because the buyer has a recourse against you. So we have the express warranties, I'll just read them through, warranty by affirmation of fact, warranty by description, the implied warranties, which means even if nothing exists, no comment is even made regarding an artwork, there are implied warranties that are imposed by the UCC on that what's, what's understood to be a commercial transaction. Disclaimers for warranties, that means the ability to say, well, no, you know, I'm not sure, or I'm not gonna hold out anything, are difficult. Generally speaking, there is a bias towards you as a seller having knowledge, having the artwork, and holding it out to the world in a way. And there's, there is a, there's a legal bias against you. The ability to disclaim these warranties, get out of these warranties without having ver being very sophisticated about it is very limited. Disclaimers for warranties can be ineffective and require drafting by very competent legal counsel. Any time the hybrid gallerist engages in secondary market sales, they confront the risk that something they are doing or saying is based on false or inadequate information. The standard of care you need to maintain is, however, directly proportional to your sophistication. That means the further you are in the game, the more capacity you bring to the table, the more weight the law will give to your statements, opinions, or position vis-a-vis -vis provenance, title, etc. Quality, qualities of an artwork. So that's also something to be bear in mind that the, that the legal obligation that comes from fraud or negligent misrepresentation is directly proportional to your ability to actually be a competent art context actor. So the better you are, the more likely a mistake can be held against you. Yes, you do need a contract. And you do one thing long enough and well enough, maybe luck will stay with you, you won't get blindsided. The more diversified your hybrid practice is, the more likely it is that something can fail. The underlying message here that we have to confront as we get into our open discussion about what tremendous opportunities exist in the present, we have to be cognizant all of those opportunities go back into various directions of legal obligations. And it's not as simple as just stepping out into the free zone and and occupying that. There has to be an awareness of what that changed model will mean to you in terms of uh, legal risks. So when you are exposed to such a complex web of largely invisible default obligations, you need to be on the right footing. Yes, you need a contract, and no, it will, won't kill you to get one. In fact, it might be the one thing that will allow you to keep going, even if you are forced to read it thoroughly. Thank you for that overview.